about 17 miles west of Taktiaktak, on the shores of the Beaufort Sea, is a traditional Inuvialuit whaling camp called Nalvogiak, East Whitefish. In June, it's along this coastline that schools of herring spawn in the warmer and shallow waters near the shore. Herring are also the favorite food of the beluga whale, and the whales will swim close to the shores to feed on these schools of fish, sometimes in water that is only a few feet deep. And it's at this time of year that whale hunting begins. For all of our people, Demapta, whaling is a part of our heritage and culture. The East Whitefish Camp is a modern version of a much older camp. Over the centuries, the Beaufort Sea has receded, but about 600 years ago, the shoreline was approximately 25 or 30 miles inland from this modern whaling camp. And the archeological dig that you see here is at Cache Point and is an old whaling camp that was on the shore, just as East Whitefish Camp is on the coastline today. This archeological dig is important in many ways because it reveals many things about how the people lived on the land nearly 600 years ago. The bones that are being unearthed here in the remains of this sod house look amazingly fresh, as though they had only been put here a few days ago. But these bones from the lower jaw of a beluga whale could be well more than 600 years old. This sod house and the artifacts that archaeologists are finding here have been preserved by Arctic permafrost. And these artifacts are providing us with more information about our ancestors' lives and the way they lived. This is the legacy and history of all of our people as they lived on the land centuries ago. This has a single barb on it, but on the tang there, the part that uh, attaches to the wooden arrow shaft, it has a ring right around that little cone. And that ring uh, was only made about 600 years ago, so this is one way we know that this is a very old uh, house, is because of this arrowhead. We're getting, first of all, the overall house form is uh, quite a small house compared to the later huge houses that were uh, built at Kitty Gazuit. So uh, we know that that's very early, also because it has the kitchen outside of the main house. That's also a very, very early, early type. And also a lot of the harpoon heads from this site uh, look very early. They, they're the types that were made between five and eight hundred years ago. The hunt required the skill of an experienced hunter, and these skills were passed from one family member to another. And Ned Kiuta tells us about his experience with hunting the beluga whale. They used to do it longer. They used to hurt them. Hurt him. Hurt him to shallow water. Yeah, chase him to shallow water. Before hunting it, before you used to chase it with shallow water, uh -huh. and you could see it was hoist. And uh, when he started to get shallow, uh -huh. all of them go to that shallow water and hunt it right there. You mean with the harpoon? You Not with the harpoon, with a, with a, with just like a fish harpoon. Uh -huh. Used to use that one too. My dad one time he did that, you know, just put a long iron on it. Mm -hmm. That came. Uh -huh. So from that time I just started learning how to hunt mm -hmm. because I follow my dad so much and chase it around with a hole. And I kill a gay area. Mm -hmm. so they used to do too long when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. We follow it so much. That's why I was hunting, start learning from that time. So I'm still hard at right now. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're getting slow now. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I do. I want to call that guy too. That guy was with kayak. I forgot his name. He used to teach us to hunt hoy mm -hmm. with a pal. Kayabay look. Then he used to go like that. Mm -hmm. They only travel together. Mm -hmm. You know, not like before now. Long ago, we used to hunt together all the time. Mm -hmm. 
on you know, when somebody want to go out, they go out, all of them together, mm -hmm. hunting together. Not like before now, mm -hmm. right now, it depends so much. Eh? Mm -hmm. Right now, it's, it's easier than the other one. Mm -hmm. And so you could chase it in any place. Mm -hmm. You don't have to look for sound mm -hmm. You could do it as long as you could it. As long as you could see the wave. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you could see the wave. You could, even you could do it in high speed wire. As long as you could see that bubble. Mm -hmm. That's why we should do that. Right now, because we never look for sound, but we just put it uh, to what right did the bay. That's mm -hmm. it. We never look for shallow water. Mm -hmm. We do it even deep water. Hunting the beluga whale is a relatively dangerous endeavor. It takes strength, courage, and a great deal of patience, even with the use of our modern technology. Just for a moment, think what it must have been like for our people long ago, when they hunted the whale in a kayak, as we watch this story passed along to us in these images and dance. And why were these hunts the object of art and of dance? Let's consider for a moment the animal they were hunting. This seafaring mammal can weigh an average of almost half a ton or more, and it can swim faster than a man could paddle a kayak. The average swimming speed is about six miles per hour, and a frightened beluga could attain the speeds of 14 miles per hour and maintain that speed for 15 minutes or longer. And to a beluga whale, staying underwater from anywhere between 3 and 15 minutes was easy. They do that every day when they hunt. All of these attributes of the beluga whale made it an animal worthy of story and song when telling the story of a hunt. When we return, we'll see how three men in a small boat hunt for beluga today, and we'll see how the tradition is being passed on from one family member to another. Whale hunting has always been a family activity. In times gone by, whaling was important for a family's survival. A good hunt could mean the difference between eating and going hungry. On average, one whale mixed with a diet of caribou, fish, and other foods could feed a family of six people for almost a year. It was an important part of our diet. Today, there are many in Uvialwood who still depend on the beluga as a staple in their diet and the ability to be successful in the hunt is just as important to these families as it was many years ago. On this hunt, Ned Kiyutuk, an elder, will be sharing his whaling knowledge and skills with his nephew, Daniel Apsimik, the way all of our people, Damapta, pass on traditions and skills. Ned, being the most experienced hunter, will drive the boat and he will teach Daniel how to harpoon the whale. Today has been lucky for them. They have spotted a beluga whale not far offshore. Once the whale has been spotted, they will follow the bow wave of this giant white mammal as it swims through the water. Although the water that the beluga is swimming in is relatively shallow, it is almost impossible to see the whale when it is submerged. Its wake is the only evidence of where it is. The whale can stay submerged for as long as 15 minutes. And in this rough water, it requires the experienced eye of an experienced hunter like Ned to follow the trail. The hunters are always careful to hunt only the male, because the females are usually with calves at this time of year. So although they've spotted the whale, they will wait for it to surface so that they can see the melon on the forehead of the animal. This takes the eye of an experienced hunter, and today, Ned and Daniel are fortunate again. 
This beluga is a now it becomes a matter of following the whale and waiting for the right time. Having a power boat makes it possible to hunt a whale with only one boat. But when hunters use kayaks, they would gather around the whale and herd it. They would move the whale into shallow water, then their most experienced harpoonist would deliver his best shot. Daniel is learning how to hit his mark, and his first few attempts don't meet with success. It's not an easy shot. He will only have a few seconds to make his hit. He'll have to wait for the whale to come to the surface for air. He doesn't know for sure when the whale will break the surface, and he'll have to make his harpoon throw from a boat that is at best a moving platform. It will take patience and a great deal of concentration. Daniel eventually hits the mark. The red jerry can you see attached to the harpoon line is dropped into the water as a marker buoy they can follow. In the past, before jerry cans were used, the hunters would use the inflated stomach from the whales they had gotten in previous hunts. This would be their way of tracking beluga once it was harpooned. But whether it's a jerry can or an inflated whale stomach, it is still the same patient weight today as it was for our elders many years ago. Now Daniel will have to wait until the whale becomes exhausted before he will be able to deliver the killing shot. As the whale tires and begins to surface more frequently, Daniel gets the opportunity to finish the hunt. The whale is now dead. The hunt is over, but the work is not. They will have to get the whale back to shore, which is about a five-mile trip. The whale will be towed behind the boat. This means that it will need to be securely fastened. A slit is made in the toughest and strongest part of the whale's upper lip, and a second slit is made under the lower jaw. Then a rope is passed through both slits, closing the mouth together, so water isn't drawn into the cavity of the whale. Once again, experience is important even on the return trip. Ned will have to carefully navigate the waters. He needs to know where there are shoals and shallows because the whale could get snagged. They also leave the jerry can attached. If the rope should break, they will be able to find the whale and retrieve it. Once they have the animal in the shallow water, they drag it as close to shore as they can, but the whale needs to be brought closer to shore before they can work on it. Ned and Daniel and the family will employ a technique that has been used for many generations before them. They will wrap the whale in a coil of rope and then pull the rope. and the whale will be rolled the final distance. The hunt is now over, and Daniel has gained more experience as a whaler in the family tradition. Well, I, when I threw the uh, harpoon, the uh, front of the harpoon head mm -hmm. was in, facing upside down until yeah. it came back up. Uh -huh. And I realized that it turned the harpoon in the opposite uh -huh. way. Yeah. Now the family joins in to share in the task of cutting up the catch. When we return, muktuk and other delicious delicacies. For Ned and Daniel, the hunt is over. And the thrill is followed by the work of cutting up the whale and getting it ready to be stored and eaten. This is another tradition that is passed from one family member to another for hundreds of years. 
First, they remove the front flipper, and it takes experience to know where to cut in order to get through the tough tendons and ligaments of the joint. The fluke is also removed, skinned and cut into pieces with meat around the joints. Once the joints are dried, they are eaten and relished as a special treat. With long, sharp knives, the muktak, the fat layer of the whale just beneath the skin, is separated from the meat. This is the best part of the whale. It can be eaten raw or cooked, and it is the tastiest and most favorite part of the whale. It is also highly nutritious, containing large quantities of vitamins, including C and A, as well as minerals and fats. Is laid Once it has been fully drained in a couple of days, it is then cooked and preserved for storage. It's a task that all members of the family take part in, and it is a shared experience. Although the tools may have changed over the centuries, the basics have remained the same from one generation to the next. <laughs> That hoil on this side of your boat, uh -huh. you boat on this side. You could see better, follow easier that way. Uh -huh. I teach him how, when I chase him those hoil, I just show him how. If you do it alone, you could see it for a, you could think of mine, mm -hmm. what I tell you. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. That. And after that, I start learning a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the way now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we had before anyway. Uh -huh. First time I teach him how. When he was doing the whitefish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. On the second strike, uh, how did it go? Can you go to the The hunt and the thrill of the hunt hasn't changed since these early whale camps were made. And standing right here in this spot nearly 600 years ago, another new hunter may have had the same feeling. This is our heritage and our traditions for all of our people, the Mapta, as they have been recorded throughout time in song and carvings. <laughs>